retaining your team or keeping your team. And that's it. These four ideas is what HR is. Man, that was a really quick presentation. Then <laughs> this is what this is what HR is, is building, bringing value to training and retaining. Now, I'm going to go through each one of these ideas a little bit more in depth. See, whenever we are in HR, the first thing that we want to do is build our team. We want to build our team. HR has an incredible impact on the future of the organization because you literally are choosing the people and bringing the people into the organization that will shape its future. Now, I've worked in a variety of teams all over the world, and generally the first question that we ask whenever building our team is, who do we want on our team? What type of culture are we trying to build? What types of people are going to help us build that culture? The reality is, is that if you can achieve your dreams all on your own, then you're probably not dreaming big enough. See, we're going to have to include more people than ourselves to do something bigger than ourselves. And while there's a variety of different metrics and guidelines that people use to find their top talent, my guideline that I use is based off of Patrick Lencioni. He is an award-winning author and speaker, and he writes that the ideal team player contains three major factors. The ideal team player is humble, is hungry, and is smart. See, the ideal team player is humble, hungry, and smart. We want to seek someone that is humble, that is trainable. Right now, the world of work is changing very, very quickly, and we are more apt to have miscommunication, have mistakes, and need further training. The last thing you want is someone with a really big ego to be a detriment to your team. So whenever you are asking and doing your interviews, Seek people that are humble. Ask them about a time whenever they had made a mistake. Ask them about opportunities to be trained. You also want to seek someone that is hungry. Again, especially in this remote time, we want someone that is self-driven, that can take ownership, especially while we're at home. We don't want our managers wondering if the people are at home doing the job for which we are paying them to do. So we want people that are hungry. So ask specifically about things in which they have worked hard for, something that they have um, they have taken ownership and they are self-driving uh, their success and working towards their goals. So seek someone that is hungry. And finally, seek someone that is smart. Now, this doesn't only mean ability and skills and IQ, but also they are smart in EQ, meaning they are a team player. So are they trainable? Do they want to be trained? And can they train with their team? And really, it's that simple. So ask about uh, situations whenever they've been working with a team, situations when they are working within an organization, and gauge how they are in their EQ or in their smartness as a team player. Now we know what we're looking for in a team member. How, how do we find these people? Where do we find these people? See, within recruitment or within building your team, there are five major ways that you can find your talent. And this can apply within human resources. I've also used this whenever I am scouting and recruiting talent within sports. Uh, I've used this whenever we're looking for uh, musicians. And so these five recruitment strategies, remember building your team doesn't always mean being in an office. These five, these five ideas stand true in all different ways. The first is a general application. So this is the most traditional. You really have an idea to build a pool of applicants. So a massive pool of a lot of people coming in, and then you can pick out the right talent. The next is a temporary job. Now, temporary could mean a temp service. It could also mean an internship, an externship, a summer program, any situation where you have a temporary contract within your organization. And this is more of a dating situation, right? So you get to try out the company and the company gets to try out you before you agree to a long-term commitment. 
The third is to use networking. Now, this is critical, especially within your job search uh, today of networking with people online using net, uh, resources such as LinkedIn, using associations, organizations. Recruiters spend a lot of times relying on their network. In fact, I've received several jobs, especially in my collegiate years, through networking and going to those associations and organizations. The fourth is sourcing. Now, sourcing is a little bit different than traditional applications. Remember, we talked about the pool of applicants and kind of fishing with traditional applications. Sourcing is whenever you have an idea of specifically the type of talent that you want. Uh, for example, you want a engineer that has a master's in mechanical engineering and 15 years of experience in oil and gas and a certification in project management. That's a pretty specific thing that we're looking for. And so this is a little bit more like target practice, a little bit more hunting, whereas the other is fishing. Sourcing is whenever you identify specifically what you are seeking and you go out and find that one or one or two people. This is also referred to as head hunting and is generally used within top tier positions. And then lastly, you have referrals. Referrals are a great way to bring in awesome talent to your organization. The idea is that you have great employees already in your team and they know other great people. And so you want to bring them in, which can increase loyalty, engagement, and really create a awesome culture within your organization. Do you want to be, you do want to be cautious about an overuse of referrals because if you only use referrals, in fact, if you only use any of these five, uh, it actually can lessen the diversity of thought and experience and background within your team. So this is a great tool that can be used in addition to one of the other four. Most recruiters use two to three of these methods to find their talent. So there isn't just a single one that is being used, but there's actually a variety that is being used to find your talent. So first thing we're gonna do is build our team. And we know exactly what we're looking for and where we're going to find them. Now, I mentioned or I compared this to dating at the beginning. And the key to dating, the key to romantic relationships, is very similar to the key to healthy professional relationships. And that is communication. And even if someone doesn't end up coming into your organization, the last thing you want to do is to be remembered as a bad date. And so it is important that we openly communicate to our, uh, to our applicants and to our employees to build that relational capital, to build our reputation within the organization. So keep that in mind as you are building your team. They might not be a good fit at this point, but who knows in the future, they might know someone or they might be a better fit at that time. The second idea is to value your team. Valuing your team is bringing value to your employees. Generally, this is seen as compensation and benefits. Now, I really want to split those two up. Oftentimes, comp and benefits are said as one word and as one single department, but in reality, they are two separate things. Compensation is the actual money that you get paid to do the job. So compensation is your actual salary. So that, and that is pretty much what compensation consists of. The benefits vary dramatically more depending on the organization, the industry. Benefits is the benefit that you get for working at that organization. This can include, but is not limited to, healthcare, retirement, a paid time off, flexible hours, a tuition reimbursement, ice cream Fridays. <laughs> there are a variety of benefits that you can offer to your team members. And this really brings us to really the fun side of HR. We get to champion the, champion the success of our employees. So this is a great opportunity. Someone comes into your office and they want to go back to school. You now have a resource that you can provide to your team members to help them pay for school. If you have tuition reimbursement, 
You can have flexible hours. You can have opportunities for growth. You can have a mentorship program. These are all benefits that you can offer to your team. Sometimes I hear people say, Amber, I don't like the word human resources or the words human resources because I don't like to use humans as resources. And I agree with you. I don't like to use humans as resources either. But that's not what we're doing in this case. We are providing resources to humans to champion their success. Now, keep this in mind whenever we are negotiating your salary and negotiating, bringing people into the team. See, oftentimes whenever we're negotiating, we first have to decide what is on the table. There is compensation. There is money. There is also time off. There is also flexible hours. Recognize what is on the table and what you can do to create an environment and create a situation that's going to work best for the new team member coming into the organization. I've experienced this on a personal level. I have been recruited to come into organizations where I have agreed to a lesser pay in order to have more paid time off and to have more flexible hours and to have housing paid for and to have other, other things included. And so first, I couldn't, get, I couldn't have that negotiation if I didn't know what was on the table. And so whenever you are valuing your team, bringing value to your team and negotiating, first take a little bit of inventory and ask what is specifically on the table. Now, our third area, so we've brought our people in, we're building our team, we're bringing value to our team. Now I want you to imagine, I'm going to call it football because we are in London today. Uh, <laughs> I want you to imagine that you have recruited the best footballers in the nation, best footballers in the world. You have a team of rock stars. You have built your team. They are all humble. They are hungry. They are smart. You are paying them the most money. They have the most benefits. They have all the resources, all the tools. And then you never train and you never go to practice and you never touch the football. Come match day, more than likely, you're not going to be playing your best. Over time, you probably will begin losing games and no longer be this admired team anymore. And it's with that idea that we need to train our team, we need to grow our talent. Mm, we'll put that. I'll put that here. <laughs> See, we have to train our team members to stay relevant, to stay competitive. It's through our training and development, our continuous education, our certifications, our growth of talent through mentorship, through ladders that we can actually stay relevant, stay competitive, and really have a powerful impact within our organization. Now, there are three different opportunities or purposes of training. Not all training is exactly alike. And again, especially in this unique time, there is a reassessment of the type of training that teams are looking for. See, these are my workout stick people. Um, <laughs> these are my workout stick people. See, there are three major purposes of training, especially within the corporate sense. We can fix an existing process system um, or product that we have. This could be that we have a broken communication system. We have a process that is not working for us. And so we have training to actually fix performance issues, to fix team issues, and we can have uh, training to fix that. We also have training to improve. Think about the football pitch. This is where we have an existing talent and we want to continuously improve. Skills like communication, like leadership are muscles. And if we don't flex those muscles and don't continuously train and continue to improve, then those muscles will become a little bit weakened. And so we have these sessions to maintain and improve our talent. And then lastly is new training. So we've seen this a lot, especially this year, in bringing in new technology, bringing in new ways of work. And this requires new training. 
especially if teams are going from, uh, say, uh, uh, SAP to Oracle, or they're going from Zoom meetings to Google Meets meetings or Microsoft Teams meetings. This is something entirely new. And so there's new training that comes on with that. So there is a variety of different purposes of training. I encourage you to look at your team and do a assessment to see what type of training is going to be best for your team. There isn't just a single one that is the right answer. In fact, there are three major purposes. And then last but not least, our goal is to keep our team. We've spent all this time, we've built our team, we're bringing value to our team, we've trained them up, we have great talent, and now we really want to keep the talent that we have within our team. So we wanna keep our team. Now, keeping your team can mean a lot of different things. Externally, keeping your team can include, or can include compliance, can include regulations, can include making sure that your organization is operating under the law and operating under industry regulations. If your organization is not in compliance, then the organization will be result dissolved have a team. <laughs> so externally, keeping your team can include making sure that your organization is operating under the right the right legal systems, the right industry standards, the right regulations, keeping compliance. Um, and so the purpose of that is to make sure that the organization is still intact and people can still come to work knowing that they have a job. So that's the first side is the external side of keeping the team. And then there's the internal side of keeping the team. And this is more employee relations. Having tough conversations is a part of the job within HR. The reality is, is that in this process, you are building a family and families fight sometimes. And in HR, we have a lot of tears. Some are tears of joy when they get a job, tears of celebration whenever they are promoted, whenever they have new opportunities, but sometimes they involve really tough conversations, really tough conversations. Keep in mind that the conversation here has not changed from our intent over here to champion people's success. And in these conversations, our goal is to help people be successful. And that can sometimes mean addressing conflict, addressing tension, addressing cutthroat politics. Sometimes it can lead to probably one of my favorite euphemisms, which is to invite someone to be successful elsewhere. We want to champion people's success and maybe, it not, and maybe it's not within your specific team. But see, no matter what we're doing, whether that be keeping the team internally and in creating a culture where people want to be there, creating a, a culture where people are going to stay with the team and you want to keep the team, having those tough conversations whenever people are not pleased and are discontent with the organization or compliance and making sure that the organization is still intact. It is critical that we take the time to listen. HR has a powerful opportunity to influence and to impact our work. We have the opportunity to influence and impact people's everyday lives. You see, we spend more time with our work families, oftentimes, than we do our actual families. And life is too short to be at a place that is simply unbearable. And so in an effort to keep our team we actually have the ability to create policies, to create practices, and to create a culture where people feel valued. They feel the growth and the development. And they feel like they're at a place that they want to truly stay and that they are wanted and desired. See, I began this conversation by talking a little bit about the misconceptions that can be had within, within human resources. 
And it's true, those, those misconceptions do happen within organizations. But I believe that one thing that we can do to transform those misconceptions, to transform the ideas that some people might have about HR is to open, have open conversations, to have clarity in our purpose within HR, and to truly build a culture where people feel valued and feel like it's a place that they really want to be, a place that is effective, that's efficient, and also really enjoyable. So uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I am Amber Vandenberg. I have worked within HR for a long time. I actually own a company now called the Pathways Group. So we work on HR strategy all over the world. Uh, I wanted to give you just a quick overview of what HR is. If you have any questions at all, I'd love to answer those. And please feel free to connect with me online. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, I'm the only Amber Vandenberg. So just uh, link me up on social media. <laughs> You'll only find one uh, on Twitter anywhere. And I'd, I'd love to connect. No, we'll definitely, we'll put all of your social media links um, in the description box below. And we'll also leave your LinkedIn and your website on the slide so people can check them out. But it's, I completely agree. Having a conversation so people can truly understand what HR is very important. And we've had some really good questions come in so far during um, this live that I thought we should probably get, get started on them. So being you've been in this industry for almost 10 years, um, and so you've probably seen quite a lot of applications. What makes an HR CV stand out? So, you know, you have to be kind of a, a personable person in this industry, but how can you creatively show that on a CV? Mm -hmm. Um, so the first thing that I do before I start looking at applications is actually look at the job description um, and to see, okay, what specifically about this job is going to apply to the CV. So having those two somewhat in sync is really important. And then honestly, one of the best things is seeing a well done resume, meaning a well organized resume that doesn't have, you know, I've seen some that are 12 pages long, that's just an exhaustive bullet point list. And, uh, you know, actually showing an effort that, okay, I've, I've gone through this, it's organized in a way that is simple for me to see, you know, to see the highlights of what they have done and how it's related to this job. That makes it really easy for me to make that decision. Like keep in mind that most recruiters spend about seven seconds per application. That is not a lot of time to highlight the best things about you. And so what I actually do is I look at the, look at the um, job description first and then specifically look at my experience and say, okay, what can I highlight about my experience, whether that be in a different font in a different area, some way that it's going to make it, it easier for the recruiter to clearly see the connection between my experience and the job description. That is just a really simple way. I know that formatting sounds like such a strange answer, but formatting is really important because uh, mm. we don't have a lot of time, especially if we are reviewing hundreds of applications every day. If you make it really easy for me to see how you can be a good fit for this job, um that just makes it easy and <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a simple decision so uh yeah highlighting the few things that are the best part about you is uh just a really simple thing to do so when you're talking about formatting would you suggest potentially putting certain words in bold or italics and i guess when you're talking about making sure that it's all formatted putting it in date chronological order um and would you also <laughs> Another question is that um, a lot of firms just prefer if you have a one page CV. Does it matter if you go over one or would you say stick to one and the bold italic? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a specific format that I'm like, you know, do only this format. Um, honestly, Google templates has, I think, nine, eight or nine very basic resume templates that work perfectly fine for me. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy seeing those. I just kind of send those off because it's very easy. Um, so just keeping it simple and not just crazy mm -hmm. busy. Uh, the question of one page is a common question. General rule is one page per 10 years of experience. Okay. 
Yeah. So that's, yeah. So if you have, you know, 30 years of experience, you're probably going to have more than one page that you want to put on there, but you still don't want to have 15 pages. So general, general consensus is about one page per 10 years of experience. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. So at the moment we're sticking to just one page, um, but um, when working on M&A projects, so you have to deal with merging managerial roles and you also have to know who to fire and where to move people. How, how do you choose what person stays and who, who goes really? Um, are you talking about in the context of downsizing or in the yeah, context I get, of well, performance? I know that there are lots of, yeah, so when with an M&A, so say if two firms are merging and you have potentially yeah. two managerial people in the same, going in the same role, how how do you know when to move someone or how do you know who to keep? Yeah. I feel like that's quite a hard thing to do and also not to upset anyone at the same time. It's a, it's a tricky. It's a, it is a difficult, um, it's a difficult conversation. So I've worked within mergers and acquisitions for a few years. Um, so first thing that we do is we do have a conversation with a person with both parties. Um, sometimes, oftentimes there are some people that are not open to the change. And so they will be mm. willing. Um, and so that sometimes that, that might happen. Um, but other than that, if there is a, okay, we have two really stellar managers, the two really great managers, they're over the same department. One was at, you know, the Tulsa campus, one was in Oklahoma City, you know, how do we bring the two together? Uh, we will actually have a conversation to really try and find a place for that excellent employee. Want to have a, if we have built a really great team, we don't want to lose excellent talent. We want to keep them. So uh, we'll have a conversation to find if there is another place for them within the company where they can, you know, provide value and that we can bring value to them as well. So, Really, between the two of some people within mergers, there, you know, there is a resistance to change. Um, mm -hmm. But then the people that really want to be a part of the organization and um, are excellent performers and great talent, we have a conversation and really try to find the best place for them to uh, succeed and to thrive. Uh, we've actually done this even whenever getting. Uh, if we have dissolved certain departments, uh, if okay. we have merged with departments, I mean, there's mm. there's a variety of different conversations. Even if a department is dissolved, we still have the conversation to say, okay, is there another place within this organization that you can uh, that you can thrive and that we can still champion your success? Um, so it really I do take it by a case by case basis, and I mm. begin with okay. the conversation. Yeah. No, that, that's really helpful. Thank you. So what is the most common way for people to get into HR nowadays? So would you recommend doing a master's or potentially going straight into a firm? And I know, especially right now with COVID, it's affecting a lot of jobs. But if you were in our shoes, how, how would you tackle the HR employment sector? Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, I would begin by networking. Yeah, begin by talking to people. Um, the HR community is a, is a really great community to be involved with. So, uh, SHRM is one of the largest HR communities. Uh, so that is the giant umbrella of HR. Um, but depending on what segment of HR that you want to get into, there's actually a lot of very specialized organizations. For example, I have a huge interest in training and development. So I'm very involved with ATD, which is the Association for Talent Development. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I am involved with SHRM, but then I'm involved with the, in these specialty groups as well. And having mentors and having people that are involved in the industry, they can provide different insights. They're also well connected and really have provided really a lot of job opportunities and opportunities in general. So using your networking is huge right now is a very unique opportunity that uh, LinkedIn is being used in a way that it was not used as much beforehand. And so I personally will reach out to people that I just want to learn from. I want to have a conversation 
And um, most of the time, especially in this season, we're all at home, uh, they <laughs> are open to, you, you know, a conversation of uh, me asking questions and seeing if they have a place that I could fit, whether it be in their organization or if they know of a job opportunity as well. So uh, I use this, use LinkedIn, use online networking, use um, associations, uh, really if we look at this, oh, let me pull this back up. Networking, sourcing, and referrals, that's three out of the five. Most of these come with existing relationships. So that's, you know, within your personal network, someone has, is referring you, or sourcing can come from me calling someone up and saying, hey, I'm looking for someone with this, 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 and this. All of these are going to somewhat relate, and to a degree, temp, uh, temp work as well. Uh, to an existing relationship. So building relationships really, I know it's a simple answer, but it is the most effective. No, um, especially no, definitely. With in HR. Mm. So. And I feel like with LinkedIn as well, it's making sure that you, um, you can personalize your invite, I believe, when you go to add someone. So that's when I guess you would send the message saying, hello, I'm interested. Yes, yes. Don't just send a blank invite, actually. <laughs> bring, bring the person, personal side back to it, mm-hmm. of course. Yeah. Yeah, so you, another you question. You the master's. Um, you know, master's can be really great. I, I do have my master's. I went into that with the intent of networking. Um, so I learned, okay. yeah, so I learned a lot from my master's program, but the best thing that I got from that entire experience was the relationships that I made. So mm-hmm. if you're pay a lot of money for education, you'll be able to walk away not just with a piece of paper, but actually with the relationships and with the connections that you have. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so even yeah. even on the master side, keep that in mind as well. Yeah, and at the King at Kings we have the King's alumni and even when searching on LinkedIn you can find people that also went to Kings and are in HR and maybe reach out to them and so that's that's a great idea. I didn't, I didn't think of that. But um, a common HR question and interview question is, tell me about your strengths and weaknesses. And I just wondered, um, so someone else wondered what, what your answer would be to this question. Oh, man. That question <laughs> is so old. Um, <laughs> so the, the original intent behind that question was so pure. Um, it was, okay, if you are not a morning person and this job starts at 6 a.m., this might not be a good fit, you know? So there was a pure intent behind the original asking of that question and it has turned into a a very strange, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) Uh, yeah, so I first wanna point that out. Um, The the original intent really was to find a fit. Um, Is this going to best serve your needs? With that, I do prepare my strengths and my weaknesses. I have some answers prepared. <laughs> With that, I talk about, I'm very honest, you know. Um, I know that some give the advice of, oh, well, whenever someone asks you about your weaknesses, just kind of say, well, I care too much. I work too hard. Uh, it's, it's not super, super genuine. So what, what I do is I talk about, okay, this is a weakness that I have. And this is something that I am actively doing. It's my hunger, right? Hungry to um, so improve. You're being humble. I mean, honestly, mm-hmm. this question didn't bring to a lot of things. So, for example, I am not a very detail-oriented person. I really <laughs> struggle with details. It's it's a real struggle for me. Showing some humble, right? I am, tr- but mm-hmm. I am really trying to improve in in being more detail-oriented. Uh, I have taken some courses on this. I have been, you know, um, I really, whenever I work with teams, I identify a very detail oriented person and actually work with them. That's a true story. Mm. I do work with them to try to help them, um, then help me be more accountable. And so I'm constantly hungry, looking to improve. And not only that, I'm working with a team member. And that shows a little bit of EQ as well. So it's me knowing a weakness that I have and I'm, and I'm working mm-hmm. towards. Now, only share a story like that if it is true, if it is genuine, <laughs> of course. So we do want to be, be genuine, of course, 
but uh, that's a question that has been asked for a long time. And so I knew that I needed to be able to answer that question. I know that my biggest weakness is attention to details. And so I do genuinely try to work to improve that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so whenever bringing up, bringing up the weaknesses question, I do encourage you to be truthful, but also take the time to explain what you are genuinely trying to do to improve in that area. Whenever talking about strengths, that's actually a really great opportunity for you to brag about yourself a little bit. Um, <laughs> love it. It's great. And so uh, bring up strengths that are specifically related to the job. Um, so mm. the fact that you're really great at walking your dog might not be uh, <laughs> uh, might, might not be really related. So what you want to do is bring up a strength that is specifically related to the job. And that's just mm -hmm. another way. Again, recruiters have a lot of things going on in their mind. And anytime that you can make a shortcut of, um, oh, I can see exactly how that is related to what I'm looking for, just making the job a little bit easier, a little bit easier saying, okay, these are the ways that I can fit into the organization and provide great value to the team. Mm. No, I think that's good. It's, it's like showing self-awareness as well, like you mentioned. So um, another question that we had, so kind of linking on to the pandemic. So due to the pandemic, a lot of employees are now working from home. So how can HR help maintain a strong and motivated work environment? Mm, that is the most common question that we've gotten. Um, yeah. so, uh, intentionality is number one. Um, so actually having that relationship is huge. So even within our team, um, yeah, within our team in the Pathways group, we have a check-in, you know, only five minutes every morning, mm. but we do a quick check-in, say, hey, good morning, how are you doing? And just bringing that engagement cycle is really huge. Um, Gallup writes that, you know, the number one question that indicates an engaged employee is, do you have a best friend at work? And so a huge question that we have been asking ourselves is how do we build an environment that is conducive to best friends virtually? Uh, how do we do that? And so we have been very intentional about bringing, bringing the human element and keeping things personal. Um, yeah, bringing the human element and being personal with our employees. And having an opportunity to build those relationships is huge. Um, another thing that we have done is we found, especially at the beginning, there was a, like a lot of organizations that we worked in, there was a sense of ambiguity of how do I know if I am performing well? Am I meeting all of the performance um, the performance expectations. And so there was an ambiguity from the employee side. And then there also was a sense of ambiguity from the employer side of what is my employee doing at home or the thing they work on. And so there was a bit of ambiguity on both sides. And so what we actually do is at the beginning of every week within our team specifically, but then one thing that we've encouraged a lot of our employers, uh, a lot of our clients to do as well, is to just really be clear on what needs to be done, what defines success for this week, or what are the expectations, um, why is that important? You wanna always tie that back to the vision. So we don't wanna just have a list of goals, but actually tie that back to, what, uh, to why we are doing this, what is our vision, and then allowing space within the how. And so then that gives a little bit of freedom to the employees. They can um, have that sense of freedom and knowing how they can get the job done. But they also know, okay, I have met these goals and these expectations. So I have met the goals and expectations communicated to me. <laughs> so there's a, a sense of fear almost of, am I doing what I need to do? Uh, you mm. know, a sense of clarity. And right now, especially within COVID, clarity is key. Complexity can jade clarity. I'll say that again. Complexity can jade clarity. 
And the more that we can provide clarity in our communication and our expectations, and really within expectations from leadership as well, it can create a sense of um, people can feel more, more clarity and more confidence in how they, how they are performing. And whenever people are more confident in what they are doing, that in turn does mean a little bit more engagement and a little bit more openness to that, those conversations as well. Mm, no, definitely. I feel like when you're Party putting <laughs> that was, relationships, <laughs> that that really, really, those are the two things we've been focusing on. <laughs> yeah, and they interlink as well. So I think that's a great point of having clear goals and also making those goals feel like you can speak to your employer about them. And um, yeah, no, that's um, very helpful. So you speak about collaborative ownership in quite a few of your talks. How does this affect leadership style and do managers often feel sidelined when you suggest things like collaborative ownership? Mm, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, indeed. It does take a little bit of humility from, uh, mm. from the management side as well. Um, I think that one of the greatest stories, so I used to be a football coach, I've coached with a variety of different European teams and um, we implemented a environment of collaborative ownership within our training. And there was a moment when one of our team members really got something, you know, the lights clicked and he, you know, the performance just skyrocketed. And in a more commando bay dynamic, he instinctively turned and he goes, you taught me that. And I had to turn back and say, no, you figured out, you know, and so it turns the praise back around as well. Uh, you know, yeah. that's something that he had learned. Uh, it wasn't something that I had commanded. And it's moments like that that showed success within within our organization, but it is something that I recognize some managers can have um, uh, a challenge of having to say, well, no, I didn't teach you that, you learned that. Um, yeah. so I, I humility. Know that, yeah, it's, it's, it is a little bit of, um, yeah, humility. So I say that quick story to say that it does change the entire environment and the culture. Mm. I have had um, managers that are resistant to that, but uh, the, and that can be resistant because it is change and it's a big change to go from a more commando bay dynamic to collaborative ownership. It is a massive shift. But, and, but over time, in the long run, it does lead to better performance. And there is a level, I guess you guys are all in school, so um, <laughs> I can bring up these. There, there is a psychologist named Bruce Tuckman, and so he writes that all teams go through stages of development. And so whenever we, we are building our team, we're forming, and then we form the team, and then whenever we storm, we go through a storming stage and we decide how do we want to operate? What are our processes? What are our norms? Performance inevitably takes a dip. And going through that process of command obey to collaborative ownership, there was a slight dip, actually a deeper dip, within our <laughs> performance as we were deciding how do we communicate? If there is a challenge, how do we uh, face that? Do we go directly to the leader? Do we solve this on our own? Do I work with any other team members? There is a storming process. There's a great book called Turn the Ship Around. Um, I forget his last name. David is his first name. Uh, but there's a great book called Turn the Ship Around. And he writes about this whole process of collaborative ownership over a long period of time. And you have to understand and prepare your management that whenever going from commando bay to collaborative ownership, there probably is going to be a dip in the storming process as you go up into uh, establishing norms. And yeah. so you go forming, storming, norming. And in that dip, you actually position yourself to catapult to your highest level of performance. And so you will end off at a higher place of performance than where you began if you truly embrace that process of forming, storming, and norming. And so I think the first thing that we do, well, I know the first thing that we do whenever we have managers that are resistant is we mm -hmm. truly show the results, we show the difference in performance, but we also 
have to prepare our managers to know that this catapult of performance of where we are now to where we can be is not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a process. Um, and But once we go through that process, it can really, really transform our teams. Hmm. No, well, so it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, uh, so uh, we had a question here. What do you think will be the biggest problem HR will face in the next couple of years? So um, in the next few years, right now, HR is really being reevaluated on how we are operating because mm -hmm. we are mostly virtual at the moment. And mm -hmm. so I think that one of the biggest challenges that we are going to face is building relational capital. So the, I referred to HR as the adult principal's office at the beginning. Yeah. Oftentimes that perception comes from only being invited to HR if you are in trouble. And one way that you can help, help alleviate that perception is to invite people to HR if they are not in trouble and, yeah. uh, you know, and actually <laughs> have that relationship and have that relational capital. And so getting counseled or, um, you know, having a conversation about low performance is not the only reason why you're being called in. And the reason why that perception can change is because we've invested in relational capital. Um, same thing with, you know, okay, am I going just for mandatory training because we have to learn something new? Well, no, we're actually going because I get to improve. We get to, uh, you know, fix something that we try, right? And so it's having a variety of all of this that we are building relational capital that can help change the perceptions of what HR is. I believe that in the next coming years with a more virtual HR department, we are going to have a greater challenge of building that relational capital and uh, having those relationships in a more casual way so that these tough conversations are not the only reason why HR comes into the room. Hmm. No, making it more not research-based, but that is my opinion. <laughs> and what, what no. <laughs> That's very, very helpful. Um, we have a question here that was, what, I feel like this is a good one to end on, I know we're coming close to the time, but what is your greatest career achievement? Oh, uh, <laughs> um, okay. yeah. So, from, from an HR side, I'm going to give a slightly non-HR answer. Um, <laughs> so That's all right. keeping, keeping all of this, all of this in mind, whenever I had graduated from my master's, I was offered the opportunity to go into a higher leadership position in HR. And instead I took the opportunity to move to Bangalore, India. And from there I became the, I was the only American. I was the only female. I was the only blonde uh, academy football coach. And so I worked with their football teams, but I also was working on their business development side. So I did a lot of their, their HR stuff. And so we actually spent time recruiting our players. So we were building our team. Uh, we found new ways to bring value to our team through our assessment, through the tools that we had. Um, of course, we were training our team, it's football. Um, and then we had retention efforts as well, as well as we had other academies. So we went through all of that. But uh, one of the biggest, uh, my personal achievement that uh, I am the most proud of is being able to work with over a dozen teams. They took us out to vacant pitches and said, fill this with people and train some of the best talent in India. And that's what we did. And we spent a lot of time absolutely transforming the, uh, the culture of the organization from a commando bay dynamic of <laughs> Stand in a line, kick a ball, yeah. wait for instruction over and over again to one that was filled with more creativity, more collaboration, and more captainship within the team. And, yeah. you know, that example and that, I guess, proudest career achievement isn't specifically a related to HR, but it was doing HR. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. And so it really just goes to show that these concepts are not specifically meant only for the office. You can take mm. these ideas 
to go into a open field in India and transform communities. No, definitely. I feel like all we were saying earlier before the call that all aspects of HR can be implemented in whatever job you do. There's so much to you want to make yourself the best employee possible so you can still learn from all of these HR theories and all of these points that you've you've mentioned before. So it's been really, really, really helpful. Um, and that brings question time to a close, unfortunately. If you do have any more questions, feel, uh, feel free to reach out to Amber on her LinkedIn or on her website. Her, con her contact information is linked in the description box below. But I'd just like to close this keynote with a huge thank you to Amber, who's kindly given up her time today to share her wisdom, her experience, and I hope that you have found this helpful. If you have any questions regarding anything that was shared today, do not hesitate to get in touch um, with the King's Business Club. Send us a message over on our Instagram at King's Business Club. Um, and feel free to share this webinar with your networks, as we spoke, networks are very important. Um, and subscribe to the KBC YouTube channel for our weekly webinars and keynotes. Once again, thank you so much to Amber for joining us today. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.